first. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so also hi from me. I'm uh, Torben, I'm a PhD student of Giovanni Bussi. And since this is our last presentation of today, I will try to stay on time. Everything I would like to present today will be in the context of machine learning in order to improve RNA force fields. And one motivation when working within this framework is that currently RNA is becoming very popular and becomes a more and more relevant target in therapeutics. And here, accurate methods which uh, can predict or design structures and dynamics of RNA are needed to accelerate uh, progress. However, already for small systems, uh, the predictive capability of current force fields is limited. And therefore, in the previous years, works have been focused on taking advantage of experimental data in order to enforce agreement with experiments. A critical issue here is to take into account errors either in experimental data or in the forward models used to back calculate the experiments from simulations. And at the same time, account for overfitting on the training data set. Among frameworks such as Bayesian inference and ensemble refinement, another formalism which allows to enforce agreement with uh, experiments is maximum entropy. And there are limits in this procedure, which are that uh, corrections are not transferable to new unknown systems. Alternative uh, transferable procedures, which uh, provide more flexibility regarding uh, this. Um, and um, they have already been introduced and we are trying to extend them. Writing this down uh, in uh, like a reweighting problem as such here, we can uh, we are we can have like uh, arbitrarily chosen correction functions, and um, which can be adjusted by Lagrangian multipliers. And these Lagrangian multipliers themselves are found by minimizing the square difference between uh, observable averages in the current ensemble and the experimental observables. And then the, the observable averages themselves are computed as uh, can be seen here. And let's note that nonlinearity can be present in observables as well as in the corrections or at the same time. And I would like to close out my talk today with an outlook going also in this direction of, of nonlinearity. One of the challenges for current RNA standard force fields is the UUCG tetra loop. And the native conformation of this motif is stabilized by an intricate hydrogen bond network. And this network is not represented correctly currently. And consequences of this have been published as in this example here on the right, where standard MD is run on the ribosomal L1 stalk RNA segment, which contains the UCG loop uh, highlighted in red in these uh, figures. And this L1 stalk RNA is involved in the process of translation by guiding tRNA during the translocation step. And it does this in this uh, native con conformation, which is characterized by a compact fold with uh, multiple tertiary contacts. And then uh, performing standard MD on this uh, system, these tertiary contacts start degrading immediately, such that after some time, one ends up with a non-native elongated conformation and which is uh, displayed basically in this uh, second snapshot. And these issues like native confirmations being 
populated with less than 1% in some cases, have not been solved yet, as even titles of recent publications indicate. And because of this, uh, we or our group collaborates closely with researchers at the Palatsky University in the Czech Republic, who are trying to resolve these problems of RNA misrepresentation within force fields. And in the past, they approached this challenge by running simulations with different settings of corrections on hydrogen bond interactions. And these corrections are switching functions based on the distance, and uh, they are shown down here in the corner. And uh, a parameter choice, which has evidently improved the agreement of simulations to experimental data, are the ones shown next to it. And these, these basically favor base-base interactions and um, disfavor all interactions between sugar and phosphate oxygens. However, our collaborators up to now only tried to change a small number of parameters at a, at a time in order to still be able to interpret um, findings and the effect of the resulting force field changes. To, to make use of all available 12 free parameters, we applied a linear force field fitting protocol to allow for a more automatic refinement, which additionally removes the human bias in this process of selecting certain interactions for correcting. And to avoid overfitting, on this UUCG motive, we included more systems. We added the GAGA tetra loop as a representative of the GNRA sequence family, to which a great majority of known RNA tetra loop structures belong. And then also uh, the unstructured GACC system, which um, as shown here on the right, the native conformations are not uh, or is not a single structure, but in an ensemble of structures, which populate um, at least two, um, maybe three, three basins. And um, in this plot, which is basically the distance from uh, a form helix. And uh, for all these systems that we see here, experimental NMR data are available. And the corresponding observables can be back calculated from the simulations when one is using, for example, forward models like these here. For the NOEs, we have this relationship of signal and distance. For the J couplings, we have the Kaplos equations, which are the relationship of uh, signal to uh, dihedral angles. And for the tetra loops, we have the native confirmation, which for which we arbitrarily are choosing the ones with ERMSD smaller 0 0.7 from the NMR solution structure, which effectively carries a lot of information. So now let me give you a quick outline first. I, I would like to um, start with the details of the first project in which we are refining existing correction functions in an automatic way by fitting simulations to experimental data. And this hopefully touches on the most relevant um, steps when applying such protocols like uh, regularization, cross-validation, and final validation. And then I have some slides which are giving the outlook for a closely related uh, project on using artificial neural networks within the correction function, but still aiming at force field matching to experiments. So let's go into the first project's details. Previous studies have clearly stated that uh, regularization is necessary when uh, one is facing extensive data sets. And uh, we are testing different regularization functions for comparison. And therefore, um, the fitting parameters are no longer um, just a function of uh, the discrepancy to experiments, what is called the cost here, um, but also uh, depends on the penalties. And only one of the penalties I'm listing here is used at a time, 
and the strength of a penalty can be tuned using additional hyperparameter, which uh, often is called alpha. And the most common regularization function is L2 regularization, which targets the magnitude of the fitting parameters. L1 also targets them, but leads to more sparse results. And this uh, can help to identify maybe the most relevant um, parameters. Besides these two, there are penalties which keep the statistical efficiency after reweighting high, because usually, uh, and as we heard today multiple times, usually a lot of uh, statistical significance is lost during reweighting. The, the inverse of the, of the Kish size can be used when a higher number of frames with a significant large weight is desired. The relative, um, the inverse of the relative Kish size can be used um, to reduce the distance of the weights uh, before and after the fitting and the relative entropy or exponential of this um, tries to tries the same, but uses the kullback leibler divergence for this. And then there are ways to embed such penalties into a protocol. And uh, I want to show you what is a standard procedure for this. It is called cross-validation. And this means to split any data set into subsets and then perform a fitting on one subset and a validation on the other. And this way, an average cross-validation error can be obtained. And here we see different uh, ways of splitting the data on the right, which, is, which are not necessarily standard protocols. And one is along the trajectory horizontally where we iteratively leave one of the subsets out for validation while trying training on the remaining and the other option is to split um, vertically which can be either, either be along uh, systems as it's displayed here or along the observables extracted from each of these um, simulated systems and the goal in all these cases is to find the best hyperparameter which uh, can be found by scanning the error function over a certain range of um, hyperparameters, as I try to show here. And uh, then a typical shape when overfitting is detected looks like uh, here in this region where we have low hyperparameters, which um, corresponds to almost unregularized fitting where the error function uh, of the cross-validation error increases again. And uh, sometimes this uh, exceeds the reference uh, error of the force field. Ideally, uh, one is able to identify a minimum within this um, scan, however. And we applied these protocols on the real data set. I have here um, the, the first of uh, four figures that are coming. And in this sub figure, we have the error function for the cross validation on um, trajectory uh, here evaluated on the training data themselves, which is, as you can see, increasing here uh, on the x axis, the hyperparameter is increasing. And um, this is by construction. Um, for all regularization terms, except uh, the Kish size, um, you, um, there will be a legend. This one is the Kish size. For all other penalties except this, the, the reference error of the force field is recovered. Um, and the reason for this, that the Kish size is not reaching there, is because our reference force field in this one, we don't have uniform weights across all visited confirmations. In this uh, subfigure here, we see the error function evaluated on the validation da data. And we can see that there's no significant difference for a range of low hyperparameter values, meaning overfitting is not an issue in this case because the traje trajectories we are using are sufficiently long. And therefore, the parameters are transferable when one is interested in just continuing the simulations on the same system that we were training on. Then, 
Panel C is again the training error. However, for the cross validation on observable, as you can see in the scheme here, and um, here the okay um, here nothing qualitatively changes, and we still have the um, by construction increasing error function. the The interesting panel is this this uh, figure D, uh, which which shows for the first time qualitative differences um, because um, for each regularization function, for each penalty, we can identify specific hyperparameters which are minimizing the error function. And these hyperparameters and the minima represent the best balance between overfitting and predictiveness. However, because of the different nature of the regularization functions, the value of the, the error function in the minima should be compared. And here, in this case, the, the relative Kish size at a hyperparameter of around 18 shows uh, the lowest error. And therefore, uh, we treated uh, it as the optimal regularization in all the following results. What we also did was additionally perform cross-validation on systems, which is yet another possible protocol, as I mentioned. And this has the purpose of highlighting the contribution of, of each system to the error function and also show advantages of regularization in the parameters, which I try to show in the, in the right half of this. So um, this first row, which I'm showing now, it shows the results when GACC as one of the three systems we are training or validating on. And in this case, GACC is the validation system, uh, always with a hedged background. And also um, some um, parameters um, are shown here on the right. Um, here, this is the parameter set of the 12 free parameters when no regularization is used. So hyperparameter equal to zero. And then uh, also um, with the regularization where we chose, as I mentioned, this relative uh, Kish size, and we extracted these parameters from the plot here uh, where you can identify the same star. So um, we see uh, maybe as one uh, first interpretation of these plots here that uh, the UUCG system um, has the highest error contribution. And it can be among the systems and it can be significantly improved when included in the training. When fitting UUCG simultaneously, the GAGA system improves with respect to its error function. And this is independent of whether it is included or not. As you can see here, now GAGA is the validation set um, and still the error function experiences a decrease with decreasing hyperparameter. And um, the GACC tetramer um, always experiences overfitting whenever UUCG is included in the training set. However, the magnitude of this overfitting is uh, within uh, experimental uncertainty and also the improvements made on this uh, other system here uh, um, much larger. When using UUCG as the validation system, its error contribution shows an optimum for all regularization penalties, while both remaining systems uh, can, be, can be improved. However, the improvements for the left out system in this case are um, significantly lower than when it is included. And this suggests that the native UUCG confirmation is stabilized by interactions which are not present in the other two systems. Then generally, the relevance of regularization can be seen also from these plots here when taking a look at the error when no regularization is used, which is um, in all these plots, the pink line. So for the training set, the lowest errors are, always, are usually achieved. However, in the cross validation, um, in the validation system, you, you can see that uh, usually the, the largest um, error functions are produced. Interestingly, uh, 
when no regularization is used, the parameters become extremely large in cases where the GACC system is used in the training. Uh, exactly, yes. yes. Um, and um, yeah, all these um, parameters are large, which means that um, the best balance uh, between overfitting and predictiveness cannot be guaranteed. However, using regularization penalties, the magnitude of these um, parameters is reduced while maintaining a low error function. And in general, when regularizing, the parameters identified are similar independently of which uh, system is left out from the fitting. And even if we um, perform a minimization on all the systems at the same time, um, we can see in the corner down here for the regularization that um, these 12 free parameters favor and disfavor the respective interactions in a similar manner as the ones above. Maybe a possible interpretation why, um, why the parameters become very large when GACC is included in the, in the training set is that um, interactions, um, certain interactions here that are extremely large are only present in the GACC non-native structure and therefore are extremely um, disfavored. Okay, we decided to use the, the obtained parameters and validate them by running new simulations on equally challenging tetramers, CAU, UUU, and again, the tetra loop UUCG. In this um, table here, we are showing um, the chi-square error, the error function, and native populations for the training and um, testing simulations. And in this table, we, we can see, we report both the, the direct results of the simulation and the results of um, reweighting those simulations to the optimal parameters identified um, by um, cross-validation and uh, later full minimization of the parameters with the ideal hyperparameter. And then for the validations um, simulations, we report both the, the direct results of the simulations and the results predicted by reweighting those simulations back to the um, starting GHB fix force field. And the improvements made on error function and native population for all systems can be seen uh, clearly. Exception is this uh, GACC tetramere system. However, as I said before, the error remains within the range of experimental uncertainty. For all three validation systems of which uh, CAU and UUU were not included in the training, a decrease in the error function is experienced, which was the goal of adding this rigorous regularization protocol. And in order to also have a more technical idea on how these parameters, which ultimately lead to transferable force field corrections were obtained, we can follow this these uh, steps in this uh, flow chart uh, here. And uh, after performing simulations, which would be the first step, uh, the, the observables can be extracted. One among many possibilities uh, to extract ERMSD, J couplings and NOE distances would be via Banaba package for Python in which these uh, forward models are already implemented. If you simply recover angles or distances, you might have to define the forward models yourself, uh, which you could uh, see here. And um, maybe something uh, important is that not only observables for comparing to experiments are relevant, but also the ones which have to be considered for the correction function. And in this case, the switching function I showed earlier has to be evaluated. But since we added GHBfix as a collective variable to a recent um, Plummet version, this can be direct output of simulations now. So among these um, observables here, um, we can see GHBfix uh, trajectories 
and as well and uh, down here um we so, load Thorben, experimented I, just yes you just you have five minutes left okay just to remind thanks again. and then using all bias potentials used in the um simulations in case you, you um, you're having some the weights can be obtained uh, by using one and then you might uh, define a cost function which takes the free parameters as an input and then um, yeah we decided here to use um, kudamat which is for most matrix operations kudamat is an open source uh, software package that provides cuda based a matrix class for Python, and uh, it makes it easy to perform those matrix operations on a GPU. And in some cases, it can offer significant uh, speed ups compared to NumPy or MATLAB. And further, you can see uh, here there are some helper functions which have to be defined, like compute new weights or this function here. And um, these basically allow the correction potentials to cause a change to the weights and the average observables, and then you compute the, the error function, basically. And the only thing that's missing then are the regularization penalties. If we choose to regularize, we can select the different uh, regularization functions, um, just select uh, the one you want to apply. And uh, finally, uh, we split the data into a training and validation set, and then we start to minimize the cost function. And we do this with a loop over a range of hyperparameters. And ideally, we store the free parameters at every step so you can recover all the quantities you're interested in. We use uh, SciPy in which uh, functions for minimizing or maximizing objective functions are provided and uh, we chose LBFGSB as a solver, which is the limited memory version of the quasi-Newton BFGS. The solver allows uh, to identify the set of parameters in the minimum in the end. And now uh, this was everything regarding the first project. And since I assume I don't have so much time left, I will be quick on this because um, our interest here is um, that we want to test the possibility to introduce nonlinear corrections in the form of um, artificial neural networks. And one motivation that I can maybe uh, give is um, like um, that, there are certain minimization problems uh, where only nonlinearity offers sufficient flexibility. And uh, an adenosine nucleoside, as you can see here in water, it can be a model system for such a scenario. And uh, if you would perform some uh, simulations on this system, you can identify interesting free energy landscape, which uh, um, basically consists of um, four states. And then you could pretend to also possess experimental information about which quadrants are populated and um, decide that we want to enforce that the um, experiments um, by reweighting. And when trying to enforce uh, certain cases like upper left, lower right, at the same time, then um, you might realize an analogy to the XOR problem, which is uh, then uh, the same as this uh, model system, a uh, linearly inseparable um, problem. And then um, when you perform a linear reweighting, you actually uh, unsurprisingly find that results are not ideal uh, in the attempt of enforcing these two uh, quadrants, while um, this nonlinearity uh, gives some additional flexibility. And with uh, such biased simulations, you can actually um, successfully achieve your goal of enforcing um, such things. So currently, we are testing uh, these nonlinear protocols, and we do this on a larger database um, of uh, all these systems that you can see up here. For them, also NMR or, um, experiment data are available. And then, um, what changed with respect to the previous project I spent most of my time on is that correction functions here depend um, not on hydrogen bond interactions, but on the dihedral angles. And you can maybe from here see that we decided to use uh, sine and cosine uh, up to multiplicity three. And later on, we will compare these, um, these fitting attempts to um, linear 
linear fitting procedures as uh, I have introduced. But uh, there will be more definite uh, results uh, coming uh, up shortly, and uh, I will just quickly conclude here. The main uh, focus was on uh, the extension of existing force field correction procedures, showing that it is possible to train in an automatic fashion um, correction terms. And we saw different forms of regularization functions and different protocols that can be used to perform. Uh, only because you are using uh, such rigorous cross-validation, you are able to identify 12 uh, or whatever free parameters. And uh, an advantage here is also that they are interpretable in this case. And in the end, um, yeah, I mentioned our interest in understanding if nonlinear corrections can be suitable or even better than linear ones. So with this, I'm at the end of uh, this talk and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Corbin. Uh, virtual clap for you. Um, okay, so the floor is open for questions. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or uh, post the question in the chat. So, yeah, I, I have a, let's say a more general question and which is partly philosophical. So if, if, if I understand th this whole fitting of force field correction procedure, um, you correct for the force field uh, of, a, of an underlying force field, which still has the same, uh, let's say, wrong electrostatics, right? So eventually, yes. If there is a mistake there, then yes. Which is, which is which is very likely because, of course, one is what's missing from the force field is 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 polarization, for example. So, um, so what, what's yeah? What's the thing? I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm, all I'm asking what's the thinking on this. So I guess it depends a lot on what one is interested in in uh, in computing, um, but. Uh, sure, surely these corrections don't, they don't fix that part of the problem, right? Uh, so yeah, okay. just, just curious to hear what your, what your thoughts are on, on this. I mean, I would agree that uh, the very basic uh, problems of force fields will not be um, changed by this. However, um, what these corrections can do is like, now, like uh, as you see, in an automatic way, in a uh, eventually um, quick, uh, adjustable way, make your systems of interest behave more uh, the way you would like to sample them, let's say. And you do it on top uh, of uh, dihedral angles eventually, as now in the current uh, attempt that we're trying with nonlinearity as well. You try to apply it on maybe one of the last layers of. Um, of what is defined in the force field. So um, you tweak it uh, in one of the last steps, which is has also its advantages. Then if you want to um, go into the really basics, um, maybe this approach will not uh, help. I, well, I mean, it, it's not a criticism. I guess it's a, a one can one can imagine that this this is a, another effective way of uh, correcting for the problems and if it, I mean if, I mean yeah. for practical the practical implication is that uh, if you want to simulate your um, sometimes very challenging systems because there's some misrepresentation yeah. if you if you just want them to run in a specific way in the in the agreement uh, to the experiments uh, way then uh, this this is maybe straightforward this is yeah, yeah, yeah clearly I, I I agree I agree um, okay, uh, questions from the audience. If someone has a question also for Matteo, you're welcome to pose it now. Uh, okay, no questions. Um, so if there are no questions, uh, I guess we'll end this session. I uh, just wanted to thank uh, all the speakers again uh, for your contributions. Um, I know it's not officially on the program, uh, but uh, the 
the gather.town uh, uh, session you know, is going to happen and we I encourage all the speakers to to make your way after this as well as the participants so that you can uh try so um with that i think uh, we can close today's session so thank you very much